Hey guys, welcome to Wake Up Missoula. I'm Scott. I'm playing a little thing that I just made in GarageBand. You can check it out on my SoundCloud. I don't have a SoundCloud, so just a little bit of music just to kind of uh, just give you a little uh, introduction into the new uh, the new day. Uh, it's uh, January 10th. I'm going to have a lot of things I want to talk about as well, and including you know pre-critic, all sorts of things, videos dubbing stuff and um, all sorts of fun things that are happening within the city of Missoula. So let's kick things off with a little bit of that weather that's happening in and around the city of Missoula. So cold out there. It's very cold out there and you can expect the weather to get only colder and colder as that cold chill is coming in um, and one of the coldest days with a high of 8 degrees is happening next Tuesday. It's on constant watch so you want to double check and make sure everything's all good but currently it is 16 degrees. Your low is going to be negative 9 degrees. Uh, actually wait no, 16 degrees Fahrenheit. Sorry I was reading that wrong. Don't believe me ever again, but of course your high today is going to be 28, your low is going to be 25. Of course it feels a little colder for sure today, but your low tonight is going to be 25, just so you guys know. Uh, Saturday this weekend you can see uh, chances of snow that is likely to happen this weekend as well. So if you guys are going out and about on the slopes and the trails, it is the perfect weekend for that as well. Um, probably Sunday is the best day for it, but if it snows tonight you might get some good powder on Saturday and then even f better powder on Sunday. So I don't need to give you the snow report because it's been pretty uh, dry these last couple days, but this weekend is going to see a whole bunch of snow, followed by a whole bunch of uh, bitter cold, so a lot of that snow that's going to be falling is going to feel like sheet rock. So let's talk about some of the things that are happening in the news today. Uh, the Humane Society, if you uh, haven't read an article in the New Zealand, uh, they just came up with a report about their 2019. Um, they've uh, had 1,400 adoptions um, and about $25,000 donations and four rescue dogs. Um, in the article, uh, these dogs are very largely neglected class. Um, according to Executive Director uh, Marta Pierpoint, they are had very little sociability up until the time they went to ASPCA, uh, American Society for the, the Preventing of Cruelty of Animals. Uh, of course, the four dogs, uh, Jackson, Buddy, Stevie, and Yoda, were transferred to the Humane Society, Society in Missoula in December after spending several months with the, uh, the, with the ASPCA. As of Thursday, Jackson has found a home, and the three others were still awaiting adoption. So if you are interested in uh, having a rescue dog, they're uh, waiting at the Missoula Humane Society currently. All right, so let's talk about some of the things that are happening in and around the news today. Missoula Rise host a uh, rally in the, uh, against uh, Senator Steve Daines here in the city of Missoula. Uh, this was uh, an event called War is Not a Game, colon, Senator Dane's office. This description stated, our global and local communities do not want war. For the military families who s have seen multiple generations on the same conflict, it, to the Iranian, Iraqi, and Afghani families in the United States who worry uh, for the loved ones back home. Part of the event uh, is to get Danes who supported President Trump in the past to let him know his uh, constituents do not want another war. So that's kind of what happened there. Um, in state news, uh, Yellowstone Old Faithful is a staple of the National Park, and two men who walked on the cone of the geyser will now see 10 days in jail and up to a five-year ban from the park alone. Uh, Judge Mark Carmen of Wyoming also said that the pair have to pay a restitution of $540, um, but it also cited an incident back in September 2019 when a man walked and fell into the geyser and died from thermal burns from the liquid in hot gases. Of course, the boardwalk in the boundaries is not only to prevent people from walking on the geyser, Geysers, but also as a safety from the geysers as well. Um, let's see, and that's what th uh, that what's ha that's what happened with them. Uh, ooh, I'm just kind of uh, all over the place with this new stuff as well. Um, in national news, one of the biggest things that happened as well is that Trump uh, um, spoke on the Iranian um, uh, military uh, leader that was bombed uh, just last Friday. On Tuesday, he spoke and he said that uh, Iranian uh, officials are standing down after an attack on a military base which left um, zero injured and zero killed. Um, part of this, let me see the civil check. Uh, da -da -da. Um, and, and of course, in the Tuesday uh, um, 
statement he said is uh, that uh, Qasem Soleimani, the military leader that was killed, was the world's top terrorist and should have been terminated long ago. And the statement Tuesday, President said Iran sh- is standing down is and pressuring NATO to be more involved in the Middle East. Mohammad Javad Javir, the Iranian foreign minister, called Tuesday's night's missile strike a uh, proportionate measure in self-defense. So far, Trump plans to hit Iran in economic sense with uh, pushing economic sanctions against the Iranian government. This, of course, was from Tuesday's um, deal. What's going on there? A couple uh, uh, other things are happening. It's ongoing. It's uh, tensions are fairly high between the two countries, and we're seeing exactly how things are going to be developing. Speaking of developing, um, Nancy Pelosi might be uh, getting closer to presenting articles of impeachment to the Senate. Uh, as uh, earlier in the week, uh, Mitch McConnell wanted to uh, basically just kind of bypass articles of impeachment altogether and just kind of start the trial to move forward. Uh, so, um, Senator uh, Majority Leader Mitch McConnell attempted to force Pelosi to drop her hold on Tuesday when he announced plans to approve Senate trial rules without the help of Democrats. Part of the trial, uh, part of the, uh, they want to bring witnesses. Part of the trial, they want to bring witnesses that were blocked during congressional hearings. Part of the witnesses they want to bring are the White House Chief of Staff Mick um, Mulvaney and former National Security Advisor John Bolton. So far, Dems are pressuring Pelosi, uh, knowing top GOP leaders will not negotiate terms in a fair trial. Of course, the biggest thing that's happening in the news is the fi- fire, which has also turned into what's called a mega fire. A couple of the bush fires in Australia have combined to make a huge fire, which is engulfing over 23 hundred square miles a single blaze more than three times as large as any known fire in california many australians uh, celebrities and groups have donated to raise monies uh, uh millions of dollars uh, to help efforts for example steve Irwin's family has successfully rescued over ninety thousand wild animals but there's a lot of animals that have died as a result of the fires. Uh, Chris Hemsworth of Thor fame has cut a check for a million dollars for the Australian's bushfire. And so far, 26 people have been killed, 3,000 homes threatened or destroyed by the fire. But uh, wildlife were the biggest to be impacted. Um, uh, the conservative group WWF uh, Australia estimates that it's 1.20. 25 billion animals have been killed in the fires and says that they fear that some species, such as the glossy black uh, cockatoo and the knee-high kangaroo, face local extinction. Livestock is estimated at losing 100,000 animals. Of course, if you guys check out a map um, of the fires, here is just a uh, rendering of the map, and this was basically from the map on Tuesday, and it's only getting bigger, and a lot of even the military at the... um, in Australia has been uh, stationed to many uh, efforts in helping the firefighters as well. Um, fires and smokes, uh, according to NASA, could be as, uh, seen as far as Chile. Uh, New South Wales police have taken legal action against 183 people, 40 of whom are juveniles for fire-related offenses since November 8th. And the statement says, uh, the statement said, the legal actions range from cautious to criminal charges. Um, nine Montana file file personnel among the 44 uh, f- uh, firefighters in the United States have deployed to Australia to help fight the massive Aus- Australian wildfire, along with Australia military uh, so of course um, if you are interested in giving efforts or donating you can go to uh, Australian Red Cross for uh, um, how you can donate and where your money is going towards so that's kind of what's happening there's a lot of big things happening in and around the world today I only tipped the iceberg because there's always something ongoing so Without further ado, I have a video I want to show you guys. Uh, this is some of the new programs that are going to be airing on MCAT. And then when I come back, I'm going to talk about some of the movies that are be happening kicking off this weekend. The United States has long reached out to aid some of the world's most vulnerable groups, but only in the 20th century did the practice become an important way in which both the American state and civil society stake out a claim for their country as a truly global power. The term benevolent empire emerged in the 19th century as a moniker for the explosion of Protestant missionary societies that spanned the continent and beyond to spread the gospel and often the purported benefits of American civilization. By the early 20th century, the enterprise had begun to morph into something less overtly sacred, more diversified in its participants, committed to the tenets of modern scientific charity and social work, and above all, tied to the project of promoting American authority, not just abroad, but at home too. Journalism. I, as a journalist, wanted to get closer to the information to help myself better understand what it is, but 
like you said, there's so much out there that this is, this is why journalists matter. This is why finding good journalists and supporting journalism that takes the extra step to verify, to fact check is so important. Um, and I mean, very simply to me, journalism is this access to knowledge and it's a privilege. And it's a responsibility. It's a responsibility on the part of the journalist to be the communicator, to be someone who works their hardest to ethically and fairly, I'm not going to say balanced because fair and balanced are very different, but to fairly cover what they're seeing, what they're experiencing, and to try to recognize our own bias as journalists. I think as a student, you, you want approval. You know, you want to, you're seeking... Uh, to succeed at something, or, and and uh, I always was perplexed because I would think, you know, I'd be painting or doing these things, and you know, you would come around and say things like, "What happened?" <laughs> <laughs> or uh, "You sure had a good start there." I mean. Uh, <laughs> but, but, I mean, he was, he had this sense of humor, but um, he was always really generous in offering me solutions. We know. had a berry famine that lasted between 1998 and 2008, affecting bears primarily in the northwest part of the ecosystem. White bark pine has been basically eliminated um, due to white pine blister rust. White bark pine was once an important source of food for bears along the Rocky Mountain front. It is no longer. Um, the wildfire regime has changed dramatically. We've seen a rapid escalation in numbers of acres burned. And over the long haul, fire may not be a bad thing, but for about 20 years after any burn, there's not much food for bears to eat. So we've seen a rapid accumulation of this unproductive habitat. <laughs> Hey guys, welcome back. Let's talk a little bit about a couple movies that are coming out this weekend that hopefully you'll try to skip, And but I'll give you kind of a rundown exactly what you can expect this from the movie. Guys are in war. They go to warn a battalion that there's, they're on a slaughter, and they do it. The end. But let's get a little more um, deal. This is happening during the Great War, otherwise known as World War I, but they don't know it's World War I because they know, know there was World War II happening. But sometimes there comes a movie that gets money for yet another war movie. This story is a duo of British soldiers behind enemy lines as they deliver a message that could save lives. It's not the destination, but the journey they take is what all this movie is all about. You know, hey, I'm all for history, and if you really want a really good, impactful documentary, I sell, I, They Shall Never Grow Old is a very d good documentary that they colorize enhanced and just made it look really, really good. Um, and it took actual recordings of the uh, people uh, from World War I, and these are interviews that they've done in the 50s, 60s, and 70s, and they piece them all together. It is very uh, seamless and very well done. I suggest you see that movie so you can have a better scope and better idea of what it's like besides just watching a movie where they say half the movie has no dialogue. Anyways, moving on to the next movie. <laughs> I know I got a lot of critical praise, but speaking of a movie that probably will not get critical praise is a, a laugh out loud comedy where uh, apparently uh, if you scream loud enough, it's funny. There you go. Uh, Tiffany Haddish smashing her that uh, 15 minutes of fame once again uh, with a little help from Rose Brynn. Uh, comes a couple of businesswomen who get jibbed out of their business by a wealthy gypped gypped. Not gyp. It's like gif and gif. Anyways, played by uh, Ageless Salma Hayek is the boss lady. I didn't want to, uh, but pretty sure uh, uh, figures out. Okay, so anyways, like it's like here's some money to help grow your business, but it's actually a uh, ploy for me to absorb your business into my own. Wahaha. <laughs> it's like well, they didn't read the fine print. Anyways, this movie's about them getting their business back and trying to overtake Selma Hayek's character. And I, I'm assuming they do it because there's probably something in the contract that says, like, oh, you didn't do this, this, or this. Therefore, it's never been your company in the first place. But then again, like, if you think about it too much, then it's like, then give it my money back because, you know, then if it's not part of the contract, then you don't deserve the money that I just gave you. 
Anyways, moving on to the next film, uh, Just Mercy. So this movie is based on a true story, so you're going to get that based on a true story money. Uh, all about uh, basically people who were put into death row because of the color of their skin. And the point of this is uh, you have a lawyer, and he's fighting for their rights. And uh, that's basically what the movie's about. It's, uh, it's, a, it's a lot of hard struggles and a lot of uh, hard uh, lessons learned through history. And that's something that is ongoing. And uh, never uh, we d it will never change unless we truly want to change. But, of course, that's what you can expect from this movie. Moving on. That's pretty much all your movies that are coming out this weekend as well. I don't want to harp too much on some of the movies because I wanted you guys to watch a very good movie. Uh, it's called Hollow Triumph, and it's been redubbed by yours truly. So without further ado, who's this? And then when I come back, I got a whole bunch of city council to get through. There was a lot going on this week, and they're talking a little bit more about that 4th Street project and about how a lot of people in the city of Missoula are not too happy about what's being built. Uh, stay tuned. Ba da 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 Da, da. Stop. Hammer. <sighs> Wrench time. Ren yes, that's right. Dun, dun, dun. Bum, 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 bum. Hmm. A cigarette shouldn't have this kind of smoke. La, 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 la. <gasps> Is that a wrench in your pocket or are you just happy to see me? Now you listen here. I got things to say. Oh, you don't you now? Everything I'm sure you got say. lots and lots of things to say. But I want to know exactly what you have to say about certain things that, that brought us to this point. In fact, where are we right now? What is this? Oh, can't you tell it's an auto shop? Oh, come on. I need a straight answer. You need to tell me what's going on. Or else, I'm going to tell the police. Judging by the look on your face, you're scared. And when you're scared, you're going to be some, doing something drastic, which is why you have that wrench in your back pocket. Actually, never mind. You might be a stand-up guy after all. I like the cut of your jib. Oh, wait, hold on a second. You know what a jib means? It means your personality, your character. I like to rule this auto shop with an iron fist. You understand that, right? Perhaps, perhaps we can be best friends after all. Maybe we can... Oh, I forgot we have to pump gas for people. Hold on a second there, kid. You think you can handle it? I'm handling it, ain't I? I got this, don't worry. Wait a minute, what's that wrench doing in your back pocket? Were you gonna re-gift that back to me? Because I own that wrench. It's my wrench. You can't just re-gift a wrench to me. That's stupid. And don't walk away from me. I'm the- uh, uh. Do -ba -do -ba -do -ba -do -ba -do -ba -do. Gotta do my job. You get in the back seat. Oh. I guess so. You might be wondering why I got you here in the first place. If this movie was more white than black, you'd be able to see this gun. Have you ever heard the story of Darth Plagueis the Wise? <laughs> Man, I tell you what, I tell you what, things are going down all over town. <laughs> I'll tell you what. So I was telling her what, I'll tell you what, and I told her, I'll tell you what. <laughs> you get the heck out of here. Now listen, son, son. you're going to have to learn to ride a bicycle on your own from now on. <laughs> I'm not your, I'm dad. Not your dad. dad. I'm your stepdad. Step and, and now I have to leave you. Goodbye. 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 Listen, Listen here, kid. kid. You're not going to make, gonna it, make in it in the military. military. You're too flat-footed. Flat -footed. Better luck Better next luck time. time. Oh, I'm Thomas the Tank Engine. I'm here to I'm take, you take you away from, from your family. family. <laughs> I hope you're ready for college. Oh, wait. I oh, forgot. Which way to the cigarettes? Never mind. I'll find it myself. I'll be back. Yes, I totally forgot at the very end to put a title for the film. <laughs> I'll have to update that later. So, without further ado, here let's talk a little bit about your city council. There's a lot going on with city council. A lot going on with city council. Well, let me tell you what. So, let's kick things off with a whole bunch of brand new members. Uh, Amber Sherrill is taken up for Ward 4. Um, John Contos is in Ward 5. And Sandra Vasecki is uh, taking up Ward 6. If you're in any of these wards, uh, you have some new members. Uh, 
Of course, kicking off the 2020 meeting is Monday's meeting. It was a relatively shorter meeting because there wasn't much talk about them having community meetings before, but the council voted on a president of the council. This is usually uh, set for a person who is supposed to represent the mayor during the city council meetings uh, if the mayor is not in attendance for the quorum. Uh, of course, the real work is a lot of Wednesday's meetings, and they talked a little bit more about the uh, the Fourth Street project. Uh, of course, some information about you who want to get more involved. Uh, Wednesday is a lot of the time and place to be where they put uh, a lot of and they flush out a lot of the projects and ideas and all that stuff. And it's good to get get, get some good feedback. Uh, Brian West's um, uh, during public comment, uh, Brian West, one of the uh, members of the community, reflects on Heidi West's comments uh, on misconceptions of the North Side. Um, and this is what he had to say about that. On this auspicious meeting, I just wanted to thank everybody, the entire council, for your diligence, your attention to detail, uh, particularly at the December 16th meeting, which I'm sure, as you all recall, kept us here until literally 2 in the morning. Um, on the topic of the December 16th meeting, uh, I want to especially thank Councilwoman West for her impassioned response during council comment at the end of the marathon meeting. Um, I think that some people present might have misinterpreted what you said as uh, a criticism of the working class people who are here to defend their way of life, but uh, of course that would be absurd. Um, I know what you were really saying about classism was a defense of the working class and against the capitalist rampages of the developer class. Uh, I want to thank you for standing up for the interests of working people. After all, they are the great majority of your constituency. And this day and age, their interests very often fall victim to the directly contrary interests of the extremely wealthy who seek to exacerbate the crisis of income inequality that is such a problem in our society. Uh, it takes guts to stand up to these powerful people. So I just want to thank you for your bravery. Um, some other more pessimistic listeners may have seen your tearful response as a cynical and transparent attempt to distract from the very real concerns of dozens of citizens who over many hours voiced their concerns. Um, but again, I think that's that's clearly ridiculous. So. All right, so that was Brian West. Uh, talking a little bit more about some of the comments, uh, Heidi West, uh, um, there was a comment during the public comment section and Heidi West referred to it later on in the meeting that there was some misconceptions about the North Side being um, a little rough around the edges. Uh, I'm not going to say too much about that. Uh, but moving on to the next thing is that we have another person. Uh, this is uh, Kevin Hunt, and he's speaking about uh, the increasing violence within the city of Missoula. I'm quite alarmed, as I'm sure everyone else is, uh, at the recent spate of reports of uh, homicides and violence in Missoula, and especially these uh, uh, sudden spur of such events that have occurred at the Pavarello Center. And what really upsets me about this is that these reports are going to have the effect, as they always do, of turning people against the Pavarello Center and against the clientele of the Pavarello Center. Well, that isn't the problem at all. The problem is that the city of Missoula, uh, under its leader, has recited a platitude for the last several years that we're going to quote unquote end homelessness in Missoula, end quote, and nothing's really being done about that. All right, so that was Kevin Hunt talking a little bit more about that. I have a couple other public comments that kind of reflect this as well. Um, he also mentioned that the city has moved people away from the downtown area to hide the issues that is homelessness in our area. Um, Gwen Jones talks about signing the collective bargaining agreement with the Missoula City Police Department. Um, police officers in the city of Missoula from 2020 to 2023 are seeing a raise in a bump in their salary. And this is Gwen Jones reflecting on just that. We're always trying to find that balance of not raising taxes to the as much as possible compared to having paying our police officers enough so that we keep good staff and we don't have constant turnover and having to retrain. But we have a good police force that is experienced and qualified. So I'm very much in support of that and just wanted to, it's in the consent agenda tonight, so I just wanted to draw a little attention to that, that that's what we're voting on and it, it is a, a big piece. All right, so um, uh, part during this meeting as well is that uh, 
many citizens um, in the city of Missoula uh, say uh, echoed the need for retention of officers. Missoula has a high rate of turnover in the last 10 years, but has seen better relationships between city and officers. One of the public comments um, talks about this in terms of homelessness and how the police are working with uh, uh, homeless people and how Seattle is a prime example of exactly how the city police doesn't know how to handle homelessness of a crime problem that the police then in Seattle and Portland and other places where the city councils don't want to be seen as repressive and so they don't allow the police to do what we would think their job is to be. And when the police are employed to do it, they just arrest the people and put them, like what happened at the Pavarello Center. This is absolutely pertinent, what just happened at the Pavarello Center. Well, what happened to that person? They were out the next day because jailing people and releasing them is not the answer for the mentally unstable, drug addicted, homeless that walk our streets now. So I just wanted to add my two cents to that in terms of police retention, having served with a bunch of the cops that still work in Missoula County and some of the ones who can't afford to live here anymore and still do work here. Uh, part of the retention problem, and I see it here as well, like I just mentioned with the POV, is we need to figure out a mechanism and maybe we can do like a, a coordinated effort between government bodies and maybe the Interfate Collaborative and the police department in terms of these recurring offenders, they just get wound and wound and wound through and out. How, we need to get them treatment so that we don't have to waste all this money on, I believe the police officers should be paid, but in terms of retention, we're gonna waste way more money trying to train a bunch of new officers all the time when we're not addressing the the root of the symptom. Uh, all right, so that's uh, uh, one of the public comments on that as well. Um, he also mentioned that Seattle Dining is a documentary that uh, reflects uh, um, the, what this person mentioned in his comments where they interview uh, police officers. Um, uh, they had a questionnaire to them. I actually watched this documentary. It's very insightful for sure how a lot of times the city uh, passes ordinance uh, that uh, basically prevent any, any kind of injustice towards the people who are living homeless, but at the same time, can't really do anything about the people who are causing problems. And a lot of this has to do with uh, how uh, drug addiction and homelessness really do go hand in hand. I mean, the Pavarella Center uh, usually has a tendency to kick people out who have a tendency to have um, any kind of drug addiction and drug problems, but the city of Missoula doesn't have a tendency to help the people who have uh, drug problems. And Seattle kind of reflects how a lot of this system is kind of um, uh, basically breaking. Um, and so if you get a chance, uh, Seattle is Dying um, is a very, really good documentary that I highly suggest checking out. It's on YouTube. It's an hour long. It's basically a, an elongated news report from uh, Como TV. And it's uh, pretty uh, interesting, uh, the, the kind of like the parallels between how they're working with homelessness to the city of Missoula as well. All right. Anyways, moving on, uh, Stacey Anderson reflects about the state of Montana has dealt with funding for services. So this is Stacey Anderson your comments especially around mental health I think that that is an issue that is um, pertinent in our community and it's a growing need and um, as it is 2020 and it's an election year for a federal and state uh, agency or state elections the a majority of the funding for mental health actually comes from the state and federal government and our state government has been cutting um, DPHHS and caseworkers for mental health. The federal government has been cutting uh, mental health services and funding for those things and they are critical for our community. And it is so many times that our first responders in our community here directly are sort of left picking up the pieces and they are um, peace sworn peace officers but they do not um, have the in-depth training that many of the caseworkers who have found themselves without jobs who provide that ongoing touch with the people who in our community need it the most. And so I encourage you to take the passion that you bring to us here and uh, spread it to other places as well because it's we all work together and here at the local co government level we're sort of the last stop picking up all the pieces when cuts are happening um, farther up the food chain. All right, so uh, that was uh, in response to a lot of the issues that are happening within the city of Missoula aren't necessarily just the city of Missoula uh, like I said, once again, watch uh, Seattle is Dying, a great documentary. Um, so that kind of concludes your city council meeting as well. The city elected the council president, uh, who is um, Brian Von Losberg, will was reappointed to the position. Gwen Jones will be the vice president of the council. Uh, council members are appointed to all committees, and then they basically determine during committee of the whole who will be taking over for certain committees as 
those chairs. They they usually spearhead the committee, but then they still need enough members for a quorum for the uh, items to move forward for the city council approval. So, committee of the whole. Um, uh, I kind of glossed over this until I found this one comment by uh, Travis Mateer, who had something to say about uh, one of the constituents within the city of Missoula. I would hope all council members see the benefit of bringing more transparency to the process of using public money to incentivize development in Missoula. Unfortunately, my experience tells me otherwise. In November of 2018, I wrote and submitted a poem to the Missoulian. The content referenced the sidewalk controversy that emerged after some, peop after some Missoula property owners got letters from the city about how much they were going to owe for their share of replacing sidewalks. If you read it, the poem was quite critical of Missoula's political leadership involved in that poorly thought out, economically distressing decision those homeowners faced. The response I received from Gwen Jones to that poem was quite startling. She used her position as a board member at the nonprofit where I currently work to take me away from my paid work duties so she could tell me her side of the story. I won't get into the details of what transpired out of respect for my current employer, except to say I received a written apology from Gwen Jones and the board was informed how my First Amendment right to free speech was very nearly violated. Everyone has bad days now and then, but what I'm starting to see with this particular public official is a pattern of disregard for the public. A public, I might add, who has every right to know about the processes and people directing public money and a right to examine who ultimately benefits when millions and millions of public dollars are said to be directed to just one developer's big drift. Thank you for your time considering my comments. I have to go back to work now. Thank you. All right, so um, part of this uh, comment was um, in support of, of um, Heather Harp. Uh, who got overall support from the community to be the chair for uh, admin finance. Admin finance are the people who work with uh, getting money and MRA and all that stuff. And a lot of people in the um, public comment sector saying that there's been a lot of forthright and response with Heather Harp. Um, but the city council as a whole, they voted in favor of Gwen Jones with a seven to five vote. Um, and here are some of the other uh, uh, committees that will be head up. Um, Parks and Conservation will be head up by Amber Sherrill, the new uh, member at City Council. Stacey Anderson will chair the Public Safety and Health. Uh, Murder Becerra will head Public Works. Uh, Jordan Hess will chair Land Use and Planning, uh, taking over for John DeBarry's replacement. Of course, it is a crucial role in working with regulating TEDs and other zoning requirements for development sites. It's also a good segue into Public Works. So Public Works, uh, in this meeting, uh, Council uh, set up a three-hour work time period to talk about the 4th Street 48-unit development in the area around, you know, it's near Bridge Pizza, Missoulian, and many citizens kept the city of Missoula past midnight on December 16th meeting and this is more of that talking about that. Nick Kaufman with w WGM Group uh, who is spearheading the development of this site um, uh had this to say during his presentations and what their vision for the property is. So we have a vision for the property and it's to provide housing downtown for a diverse population not for the wealthy and not for the out of state. We want we want occupants who want the amenities of downtown without having to drive downtown. We want the continuity between residents and downtown. We want walking access to neighborhoods, the U of M trails in downtown. This is a hub of about four different neighborhood districts. We're asking for up to 48 units, about 75% condominiums and the rest apartments. We will provide an underground parking garage and do our best to improve neighborhood connectivity. Part of uh, the big thing is that infrastructure. So part of the infrastructure is that with the rezoning, they want to kind of do like a whole right of way kind of deal so they can um, enhance the parking in that particular area. Many citizens are concerned, which is clear because it's a lot of neighborhoods, a lot of houses in that area that uh, already have trouble finding parking. And it's a lot of blended areas because it's so close to the uh, downtown area, which is why a lot of the city of Missoula thinks that this is a perfect place for such a large unit complex. Uh, um, it's good for developers and the city as a whole for part of their um, uh, Place Called Home downtown initiative. It's called A Place Called Home, part of our Missoula. This has been a huge uh, undertaking with a growth inward. The growth inward is just another way of saying, um, well, a lot of people are saying is just more gentrification, but a lot of times the city with the downtown master plan is trying to figure out a way to kind of help stop gap a lot of these larger developments from developing with a lot of uh, basically uh, mini uh, big developments. It's, it's a weird kind of thing. It's a, it's a weird consensus, consensus, but with the downtown master plan, it kind of is preventing a lot of those huge, huge structures from being built as well. And uh, Nick Kaufman, he's uh, addressing some of the costs to some of the uh, 
um, new units that will be built there. So based on input from the uh, public process, there's been a lot of um, testimony from opponents about what these will sell for and what they won't. So several units will be below 250,000 with deed restrictions. Approximately 50% of the <laughs> units will be below 500,000. And the average price, if you take the average price of all the units we propose, it's less than median home price in the university district. They're at about 530,000, we're at about 500,000. We're trying to attract local buyers. We have 40 people currently on the wait list. 34 of those are from Montana. We've had supporting public comment, local perspective, buyers who have worked hard and want a nice place to live downtown. All right. So uh, that's uh, Nick Kaufman's um, presentation on this as well. Um, one of the few people that are, uh, I, mean, I mean, one of the many people during this uh, uh, public comment section, uh, Copeland uh, Butchinol, of uh, reading a statement by residents of uh, one of the buildings that are being torn down if approved for this zoning. Um, this is what he had to say in this statement. Members of City Council, the sad reality of this meeting pertaining to the rezoning of 4th Street is that development will happen whether you vote for or against this project. Burquist, unfortunately, can still build within the zoning regulations that currently stand. While I'm disheartened to lose a vital part of Missoula's history and my home, I am hopeful that you will take into consideration all of the public's concerns for loss of affordable housing, loss of character in the neighborhood, and concern for future development in Missoula. Should you vote yes and allow for the building of 48 condos, I urge you to hold Cole, Burquist, and WGM Group accountable for all that they have promised, not only to you, but also to community members. All right, so a uh, part of the statement um, and part of a lot of the public comment is that um, if they, they can't really do anything about the development, they want to make sure that the city is keeping uh, tabs and making sure WGM, WGM Group and the developers aren't um, going back on a lot of their promises that they're making during their uh, initial uh, presentation. Michael Alberton showed the range of support of this project um, and also the range of uh, not support. I'll keep it short. On October 8th, WGM sent this letter to Andrew along with their rezone vacation applications. They state in page two, the project will not be possible without the support of the community. This support includes a change of zoning to B13 to allow for higher density residential development. Since we've been, we've had a planning board meeting, two committee meetings, and a council meeting. The public's response in both oral and in writing is overwhelmingly opposed to this project. These are the people who are on the record that oppose the project. Here are the people that support the project. Okay, so who are these people? Okay, they're from every ward of the city. They're from all your wards. Uh, they're young and old, they're homeowners, they're renters, they're small business owners, they're students, they're retirees, they're really a diverse cross-section of Missoulians, and they have articulated many compelling reasons why they don't support this project and why the council should vote no. I urge the council to listen and read all of the comments. All right, so uh, part of this as well is just kind of give a scope of just, uh, there was petitions that were signed, uh, overwhelming um, uh, um, it's trying to find another word for anti-support for this project as well. Um, of course, he did, uh, Michael uh, Albert, uh, Alberton, he talked on many points that people had to say on this, uh, showed slides of buildings that reflect the mixed commercial uh, buildings like of Rome, and there was a cross from Silver Park. Just kind of like, kind of examples of what people can kind of see moving forward on this as well. Uh, one of the things uh, um, many of the comments were uh, co concerned and also uh, saying that uh, ref affordable housing is something that uh, is just definitely impossible, especially if you live in a brand new building that's so close to downtown, especially in the university district. And this is uh, Sam Duncan. Uh, once again, she uh, spoke earlier about this, um, and this is what she had to say. I just want to point out that an affordable home price for a house of two at 120% area median income would be $240,000. So for 80% area median income, it would be $161,946. And those numbers aren't even close, um, which means that none of those units, the cheaply priced ones, would be affordable for anyone making 120% AMI or lower. So I don't think it's a misconception that this is not an affordable development. Um, and then the average price would be less than university district median home prices. 
we know that these are not affordable prices, so I don't know why this would be a misconception. Um, the, this is one of the least affordable neighborhoods in this town. Um, so I'm wondering what kind of diversity these developers are saying they're bringing into this development, given these proposed affordable options. Um, and to point out that this is not workforce housing, and I just want to be clear about that. All right, so that was Sam Duncan talking uh, about that. Um, the presentation, each condo would sell a $250,000 price tag. Brian West talks about the consequences of approving this project. The original presentation on December 16th, uh, Nick Kaufman claimed that they had offered compensation to all of the residents. Um, one resident sitting just behind me had been mentioned in the Missoulian a week or so before, and so Nick Kaufman joked that, oops, we seem to have missed one, but I'm sure we'll correct that. We've already heard from at least one other resident of the area who has not been offered compensation. Um, I would be very curious if any of them have been offered compensation. I think it would be appropriate for the city council to find out if those members have been offered compensa compensation, the people who are going to be displaced by this project, because if they haven't, that means that he lied to your faces. All right, so uh, uh, reflecting more about displacement and uh, renters and all that stuff, I mean, Missoula has a lot of renters, and there's a lot of uh, places in which renters have a, uh, should have a lot of rights within renting a lot of these places as well. But then on the more heartless side of when you're renting as well is that the land Owner who, who wants to sell, they can pretty much just kick people out. I mean, they have to give uh, part of a lot of different laws and different things. They have to give you notice of which uh, of how long you get to vacate the property as well. Because I've seen it all the time. Many times landlords are just like, "Hey, um, I'm selling my house. I just want to get it show ready." So you have to move out in like 30 days or 60 days. It really just depends upon each uh, uh, scenario. And a lot of times you have to, if you look this up yourself, you can see that many different communities and many different states have different rules in place about how many days or even in the contract you'd be like you have to give at least 30 days notice before you vacate and vice versa they have to give you 30 days notice um that's that's pretty uh, clear on terms of that uh vouchers and compensation for being displaced um I mean, that's something that's relatively new. And according to Aaron P, an Office of Housing and Development uh, reflects on this. None of these programs exist today. We're creating them in relation to these conditions. Our department is well aware of rent caps in the HUD, fair market values as they apply to vouchers, and um, what we would have to do to make that program effective and to ensure that landlords don't just wait out that marketing period um, to be able to charge a higher rent. These units would have to be capped at HUD fair market value and the developer is aware of that fact should they elect that um, that option. So all of those details would be worked through in that developer okay. agreement. So it would be unfair to say that you were blindsided by any of that and, and it would be more accurate to say that your office was aware of all those constraints and, and would be working on them. We're, we'll, we'll be building that program out in response to this, exactly. Thank you. All right, so part of what uh, Aaron Pian is doing is uh, working with, uh, you know, b for people who are purchasing houses and people who are renting apartments uh, houses as well as stuff like that to help uh, people get the fair deal um, and a lot of this the part of the voucher in terms of uh, some of the uh, affordable housing um, there um, otherwise you know there th it, this is a very interesting kind of like uh, deal that they're going through as well and the city is basically leveraging uh, x amount of units so they can provide about a good percentage of the units because about 50 percent of the units are going to be just sold like any old apartments and then 25 percent are going to be used for that affordable housing with people who have vouchers and then another uh, 25 percent are the rental ones as well so there's 48 units and there's only about four uh, 48 units, if you do the math, a quarter of them is about, uh, let's see, <laughs> uh, let's see, eight times four. So, yeah, I mean, it's basically about uh, eight, four units will be used for um, um, affordable housing, um, for vouchers for people who have a certain medium income that is below the average, and to help them get there as well. Uh, I mean, it's uh, okay, so one of the meetings is that the, the newest thing basically about the fourth street issue the deal is that they're um working on figuring out exactly what is actually going to happen with developers because development's going to happen 
I mean, that, that is perfectly clear, but part of the rezoning is figuring out how big or how small the development's going to be. So they came out with four scenarios. In one scenario, there's the 48-unit complex uh, that was proposed from the start, like everybody knows. Uh, there's the up to 17 units built within the improvements to connect nativity and parking, but then again, a lot of those units will be uh, higher priced, and there was only maybe going to be maybe two affordable housing units. Uh, and then there's the other one where there's 31 dwelling units, no improvements or affordable housing units, so they just build a, a complex um, but with no affordable housing. Uh, then there's the ever 11 dwelling units, no improvements, and the city will basically not vote on anything, and they're just going to have uh, – it'll be basically matching more of the aesthetic of the neighborhood. Um, so part of the rezoning is to leverage the affordable housing units and to reflect the need for Missoula's growth. Um, the, uh, of course, if you actually even look at some of the uh, uh, the neighborhoods in the university district as a whole, one of the things that you do notice is that most uh, median prices for homes in that particular area, area are as small, as little as $500,000 to as much as $1.8 million for a lot of the homes in the university, university district. You can look at some of the maps and just see uh, when you're uh, house shopping on certain real estate uh, websites as well. But you do notice some of those high prices within the university district. It's a college town and uh, being near the college um, near amenities is uh, such a huge deal for a lot of people, especially near trails. And that's how uh, it's kind of growing with that. And uh, part of this whole leveraging and having all this, uh, like uh, WGM Group was saying, is that they're working with the public and just saying, it's like, we don't want to uh, have uh, high... Um, prices for these condos or units just so people from out of state can move in here. And part of that is to f figure out the people who are, uh, who are in Montana or live in the area who can afford this, but the people who really can't afford this because not many people in Missoula can actually afford to live in Missoula. And that's no secret because that's something that is kind of affecting a lot of people in around the uh, basically the, uh, the United States is that there's a lot of cities that are on the grow such as Missoula, and one of the biggest things that they were talking about is that uh, Missoula is at an annual growth of about 2% a year, which uh, with the need of housing, uh, they say that they need about like five to uh, 600 uh, units or homes for people uh, every year. And uh, part of this is as soon as there's a property for development the city within the city, the city wants to rezone it so they can add more affordable housing. So it's not as min much as affordable housing. Uh, one of the biggest things that happened during the, uh, the six and a half hour meeting is that they did talk about um, that they're losing affordable housing just based on the tearing down of some of these old buildings. But a lot of times the reason why there's such a low rent in the first place is a lot of these old buildings are 100 plus years old and they're uh, falling to the, the statue of old buildings where they can't be a, a rent, can't be a certain height. But regardless of that, if they get a bunch of new buildings there, which is already being planned regardless of uh, public's input because uh, it's, it's, it's a whole kind of thing because it's private property being sold and the developer is going to develop and that's just kind of how it is. And the city, the only thing they're really kind of doing is leveraging the right-of-way stuff so it can actually move forward. Okay, that's everything. That is kind of what's going on there as well. Um, yeah, I mean, you know, like the public can say as much as they want to say. Um, and the rezoning can be uh, done or not, but that's not going to stop development. All right, and uh, yeah, sorry, <laughs> in the, it ended on such a somber note for sure because, uh, I don't know, this is kind of like a, uh, uh, a very, very interesting kind of situation going on for sure. All right, moving on, I am going to stop talking about your city council report because I am running out of time. Um, about, I have about 10 more minutes left in the show, but I want to uh, devote it to some more stuff, including this art clip I'm about to show you guys. And then when I come back, I'm going to talk about some events that are happening within the city of Missoula. So stay with me.
Yes, there's a lot of great public art out there. And one of the things that I think is really cool about this upcoming um, today as well, well, upcoming events that are happening today as well, is uh, there's an art exhibit that's kicking off at the Zach today. I want to talk about it. It's called the Youth Gallery. And part of the Zach is a thrill to show local painter uh, Illa Bell in the Youth Gallery for the month of January as an opening reception. It's from 5 to 8 p.m. Uh, and yeah, it's going to be really cool because part of Zach's thing is that they want to encourage more young youth artists, but you know, like a young middle school, uh, pre-college kind of deal. And I think it's really cool what they're trying to do. Um, many things that are happening as well in the morning is Tiny Tales and Storytime at Missoula Public Library. The... Um, and, it, and it's a great opportunity for a lot of kids to go to the library, learn um, some new words, uh, get in, 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 engaged with books. Because a lot of times it's a lot harder for kids to um, in, be interested in reading or writing or any of that stuff as they get into school, where a lot of times uh, it's spent playing catch-up for a lot of the kids. So it's a good way to get them started. Um, Spectrum Discovery Center is talking about the human body, learned about the systems of the human body and how they work. Uh, things open up at 11 a.m. this morning as well. Um, and it goes on until about 5 p.m. So if you have any after school plans, you can go check out there. If you're gonna if you're gonna take a break for lunch, why not go to uh, Missoula Senior Center for some cribbage and bridge? Play some cribbage and bridge at the Missoula Senior Center. It's usually around 12.30-ish. You know, you can have some lunch, hang out with some folks, and destroy some people at cribbage, like I love to do. Uh, family fun time at the YMCA. Um, this happens Tuesdays, Thursdays, Fridays, and Saturdays, but most of the time it happens from 9 to 11.30, but Fridays is an afternoon deal from 3.35 p.m. It's $17 per family, but if you are a member of the YMCA, why not? It's a great place just to kind of hang out and get out there and join in fun, indoor fun, especially as a it gets colder and colder outside. Um, yeah, there's a uh, paint and zip rainbow ga a galaxy. It's painted with a twist. It's in the Steven Center. This one is awesome. Nothing more magical than rainbow galaxy and some happy little trees. Instructions are guided and supplies are provided. Um, it's a really cool place. I walked by there just the other day. It's a really nice art um, installation. A couple rows of uh, canvases, and you just kind of hang out and paint all day. All right, so here's some of the late night meeting, uh, late night deals. If you're kind of going out and about tonight, John Floridus is going to be playing at Highlander Beer, bluegrass, uh, all sorts of great music. He's kind of like a, a Pearl Jam artist, uh, the Pearl Jam band, all rolled up into one guy. So you can check that out. Um, you have Loose String Band at the Montana uh, Distillery tonight at 6 p.m. Uh, you have, um, let's see, Family Friendly Friday at the top out, of course, every Friday. It's uh, 6 to 9 p.m. for a lot of uh, parents and their children to just kind of enjoy some family fun atmosphere. You got the Worldwide Cinema at the Missoula Public Library. They have a movie uh, tonight at 6 p.m. Um, let's see. If you're interested in going out and about, they got Pale People album release party at the Zach. So you can go there for uh, the art of the young lady. And then you can enjoy some music of an album release party. Then you got Neon Lights of Flying Squirrel. It's like a flying squirrel indoor uh, trampoline fun place. But Neon Lights. You got Dead Hipster Presents I Love the 90s. Hey, if you love the 90s, I hate the 90s. Just between you and me. But if you like the 90s which I'm sure a lot of people do because it's nostalgia, blah, blah, blah. Uh, you guys can go to the Ballander tonight. Cash for Junkers is going to be Union Club. And then Hellbound Glory. It's the name. I can I can say it on TV. So it's going to be at the Top Hat Lounge. It's going to be some country music at the top. Hey, I don't know why I <laughs> like that. All right, so if you're interested in uh, being a first-time home buyer, uh, you're looking for a new home, and Homeward is the place to be because Homeward is a wonderful opportunity. I went through Homeward to buy my first house, and you can too, and they give up to a $5,000 grant for your first home buy, which is really cool. This class is held tomorrow. It's from 6 a.m. to uh, 9, I mean, whew, not 6 a.m., 9 a.m. to 6 p.m. And then, of course, they have a bunch of um, uh, smaller classes, so you can adjust it slowly and day by day. It's a Tuesday through f a Thursday class from 6 to 9 p.m. starting uh, January 28th through the 30th. Um, Let's see. Yeah, you're thinking about buying a home? Learn the basics of home buying process through the Nationally uh, cer Certified Home Ownership class. Then there's Winter Storytelling by Bill Taylor. This is at Traveler's Rest State Park. Um, you, retired teacher and an author, Bill Taylor, talks about the railroads, how railroads shaped Montana. Railroads. Anyways, Cat Castles, Missoula Public Library. Got leftover boxes for the holidays. Come use the supplies to build your own cat or other small pet, a fun castle. Uh, so, hey... <laughs> 
cardboard castles. So at 1 p.m. and it's going to be in the large meeting room from 1 to 5 p.m. So if you have a bunch of boxes, cardboard boxes, all that stuff, this is the place to be. Or if you want your kid who's a little bit older and who wants to uh, um, do some animation, stop animation, some live action stuff, MCAT Saturday drop-ins happen every Saturday from 1 to 5 p.m. It is a great way for kids to get engaged with media and create their own stories through a television medium that is MCAT. And if you're interested in being a part of MCAT, don't fret, because every second Wednesday of the month is orientation. We had a large pull of people come in last orientation, about up to seven people. Um, of course, but if, of course, if you just want to come down here, we are open from 11 to 5 p.m. Tuesday through Friday. And yet some people always want to come on Monday. I don't know. That, that's always just going to be the thing. Anyway, so that's, you can check that out and more. I just also wanted to mention that Ballet Beyond Borders is be presenting their uh, gala uh, finale tomorrow night at 6 p.m. So these are happening on your Saturday as well. Uh, Ballet Beyond Borders used to be Vienna International Ballet Experience, um, but of course MCAT is live streaming uh, this event. I think they're stre they were streaming it all day yesterday. And I believe you can watch it live now, but I'm just going to double check to make sure. I'm 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 venting. I'm uh, I don't see any local live stuff. <laughs> I guess I don't see it right here. So let's move on. Okay, so if you're interested in doing a uh, a fix-it clinic, join Missoula's Repair Revolution um, Home Resource. Uh, make uh, your New Year's resolution to join Missoula's Repair Revolution. So if you don't know how to repair something and you need something to repair, you can bring it to Home Resource starting uh, during their fix-it clinic at 11 a.m. on Saturday as well. Man, that's kind of misplaced at the tail end of your Saturday. Um, let's see. Where was I? Oh, weird. I had it on here twice. Okay, the first clinic's on Sunday, and that's from 11 a.m. to 3 p.m. It's home resource. You can't miss it. And then, of course, if you want to do some dancing, you got Dance Church. The Downtown Dance Collective is a nonprofit here in the city of Missoula, which engages in dance and dance classes. And, and Dance Church is every Sunday from 11 to 11.30 on Sundays. Uh, there's Tanya. Uh, the, uh, uh, Gabrielian uh, Celebrate Piano Series. Uh, London Times uh, hailed her as a pianist of powerful physical and imaginative muscle. Tanya has captivated audiences worldwide with her gripping performances. She has performed on four continents in acclaimed venues including Carnegie Hall, New York, Kennedy Center, Washington, D.C., Sydney Opera House, Queen Elizabeth Hall, and, and Wigmore Hall in London. Um, also sail court in Paris and such orchestras, and she'll be playing here on Sunday at 3 p.m. at the U uh, University of Montana. You can check it out. It's going to be University Recital Hall. It's $10 for students, $20 for all the rest of us, $15 for anyone uh, 60 and over. It is going to be a wonderful experience, and that's about time for me. <laughs> to wrap things up and I want to say thank you for joining me this morning and for Wake Up Missoula I'm Scott Ramph take care mm -hmm.